Okay, so this is just a continuation from uh, the other day. Um, remember when we talked about the ventilation to perfusion ratio, what we call the VQ ratio? And we said generally it's around 0 0.8 in healthy people. Um, so in other words, ventilation is approximately equal to perfusion, right? So your cardiac output, you need to basically match your cardiac output with So your cardiac output needs to be matched with good, good with your minute ventilation, right? Your minute ventilation should match your cardiac output approximately, okay? Have you guys ever heard of the term VQ mismatch? VQ mismatch means that this ratio is altered in some way, okay? And there are two general types of VQ mismatch. There is something called shunting and something called dead space. And I just want to make sure you guys are all on the same page as to what these mean, because they mean two different things. So when we say somebody has shunting, pulmonary shunting, they have normal perfusion, okay? So blood flow to the lungs is normal, okay? So VQ... So the perfusion is normal, but the ventilation is altered. So blood can flow through the alveoli, but lack of ventilation ensures that there's no gas exchange. You guys okay with that? So three primary causes of shunting are pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and pulmonary contusion or bruising of the lung. And does that make sense? That if there's something in the alveoli, some fluid, some inflammation that is preventing air from getting into the alveoli, there won't be ventilation, right? But blood can still perfuse or flow through the capillary beds of the alveoli. Does that kind of make sense? So those are disorders of shunting. Dead space, however is normal ventilation. Okay, so you can get gas in an alveol alveoli, but there is low perfusion. And what do you suppose the classic example of uh, dead space would be? Pulmonary embolism, classic, right? You have a decreased blood flow, but you can still ventilate. Um, ventilator circuits... If you put somebody on a ventilator or you insert an advanced airway, what have you done? You have added additional space. Because normally we don't walk around with three feet of, of corrugated tubing coming out of our trachea, right? So when you put somebody on a ventilator and you have all that tubing added onto them, that space, right, where you have ventilation, you have air moving, but do you have any perfusion? No. So if you are administering a tidal volume, let's say your tidal volume is 500, some of that tidal volume is going to get lost in that tubing that comes out of the patient, right? And that might possibly be a problem. And so there are three different types of dead space, okay? There's what we call anatomical dead space. This is just due to the normal anatomy of your body. And this is about one milliliter per pound of ideal body weight, okay? So a, you know, a 70 kilogram, that's about 150 pounds. So your average generic 70 kilogram patient is going to have 150 milliliters of dead space, just normal. That's just normal. Does that, does that make sense? Now, when we talk about pulmonary embolisms and things like that, um, that is what we call physiological dead space. That's due to some sort of perfusion problem. And then mechanical dead space is dead space that we add due to ventilator circuits, endotracheal tubes, advanced airways, and so on. You guys okay with that? 
So you guys are all familiar with calculating minute ventilation, or VE, right? What's the formula for minute ventilation? Good. So the tidal volume, it's a product of tidal volume and respiratory rate or frequency, right? Now there is another concept known as the alveolar minute ventilation. So this is the actual amount of air that gets in and out of the alveoli. Okay, and, and it's not really complicated. All you do is to calculate that, you take, so alveolar VE equals the tidal volume minus anatomical dead space, okay, multiplied by the rate. So let's say that I have a 70 kilogram patient, okay, that's their ideal body weight. We are giving them a tidal volume of 500 milliliters. How much dead space do they have? 150 Good, right? Because 70 kilograms is approximately 150 pounds. Okay, that's 150 milliliters. So all we do is we take 500 and we subtract 150 milliliters from that. And that gives us 350. And then we multiply that by, let's say the rate is 10. And that gives us 3.5 liters per minute. So their minute ventilation would be five liters per minute, right? But when we account for dead space, anatomical dead space, that gives us 3.5 liters per minute. Does that, does that make sense? So it's a little, the alveolar minute ventilation is going to be a little lower. Cool. All right. Um, and then some, uh, just a few additional tests that you might be able to do if you have ABG. Okay, the first one's called the PF ratio. This is really cool. It's really easy to calculate. It is the PaO2 divided by the FiO2. And basically what this tells us is it's the FiO2 level needed for a certain, or rather, it's what PaO2 is associated with FiO2. So basically, if my PaO2 is 100 millimeters of mercury, what FiO2 is needed to produce that. Does that kind of make sense? Um, it is an indication of how well oxygen is getting across your lungs. Because right? if I say somebody has a PaO2 of 100, would you guys all agree that's good? Right? Because what's your normal PaO2? 80 to 100, right? So most of you would be like, yeah, that's a good PaO2. But what if I told you it took an FiO2 of 95% to get the PaO2 of 100? Oh, that's what the PF ratio tells us is, oh, what is the relationship between these two? Because you should have a PaO2 of about 100 at an FiO2 of 21%, right, or 0.21. That's appropriate relationship. So um, let's just work through an example. My patient has a PaO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury on room air, which is what? 21%. So all we do is we plug the PaO2 in and the FiO2, but we need to make sure the FiO2 is in its proper fraction. So 0 0.21. So 100 divided by 0 0.21 gives us 476. And the way that this works is a normal PF ratio is about 500. Okay, so if it's around 500, that's normal. You guys okay with that? If it is between 2 and 300, that is a mildly altered. 100 to 200 is moderately altered. And less than 100 is severely altered. And generally speaking, if you're in the range of, of about less than 250 you need to be thinking about ARDS. Does your patient have ARDS or are they developing ARDS? That should be something you want to be thinking about. So it's kind of a quick spot test that we can so, do. So the only time we can get severe is if like their PO, PO2 is, it's 
going to be less than 100, and then you're, they're on 100% oxygen. Well, yeah, well, let's say, let's say their PaO2 is 100. And they're on 90% oxygen. What's 100 divided by 0.9? It's above 100. What is it? It's, it's going to be like 100 and some change. Yeah. 111. 111? That's awful, right? Yes. Because it's, it's, it's certainly far less than 250, right? So does that make sense? Well, I was just saying as a quick reference guide. Okay, yeah. Someone with a PAO 250, yeah, if it's less than 250, you need to be concerned. Yeah. Even though that, you know, puts you in the mild and moderate, yeah. Um, if it's less than 250, you need to be concerned about, about ARDS specifically. So it's kind of a quick, easy thing that you can do. And what it does is it reflects something known as the A to A gradient. That is the pressure of oxygen in the alveoli minus the pressure of oxygen in the arteries. All right. If you want to know what your physiological dead space is, so let's say you're worried about somebody having too much dead space, maybe, you know, PE or whatever, um, if you have their ABG and their end tidal CO2, you can calculate it. Okay. It is I just remember Paco minus Paco over Paco. Paco, Paco, Paco. So it is the PaCO2 minus the entitled CO2 or the PETCO2 divided by the PaCO2. So let's say that my patient's PaCO2 is 40 and their entitled CO2 is 35. So I go 40 minus 35, which is what? 5. Divided by 40, what's 5 divided by 40? 0 0.125 or 12.5%. So that tells me that 12.5% of the, the, the gas is going into dead space. Does that, that make sense? And remember, a certain amount of that's normal. And generally speaking, 28 to 33% dead space is considered normal. This tends to go up if we intubate somebody and put them on a ventilator, it may even go as high as 60%. But if you have a person that is spontaneously breathing and their dead space is significantly higher than 33%, you need to be thinking of a physiological problem that may be accounting for that dead space, right? Do they have some sort of perfusion problem or pulmonary embolism or something like that? You guys okay with that? And then finally... Assessing for hypoxemia. This is a little more complicated, and I'm just going to run through it. I'm not going to expect you guys to memorize this stuff, though. Um, now, if you go to respiratory school, you'll have to memorize this in so much gory detail. It's ridiculous, but you guys are okay. So guess what? We can actually calculate how much oxygen they have in their blood, and it's called the CaO2, the content of arterial oxygen. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we have two forms of oxygen. We have oxygen bound to hemoglobin and oxygen dissolved in the plasma. Where do you suppose most of your oxygen is? Bound to hemoglobin. So that's where we're going to start. So you need labs. You need your hemoglobin. Whatever the hemoglobin value is in grams per deciliter, okay? A deciliter is 100 milliliters, right? Um, you put that in. So if their hemoglobin is 15, for example, you put 15 there. And then you multiply that by 1.34. And then multiply that by the SAO2. Now, not the SPO2, but the saturation of arterial oxygen. So basically what this says is one gram of fully saturated hemoglobin will contain 1.34 milliliters of oxygen. Does that make sense? One gram of fully saturated oxygen contains 1.34 milliliters of oxygen. Make sense? Okay. So then we take our dissolved and your PaO2, and then you multiply it by this constant here, 0 0.0031. So every millimeter, one millimeter of mercury of oxygen pressure is 0 0.0031 milliliters of oxygen. Quite a bit less, huh? All right. 
So let's just say that my patient has a hemoglobin of 15, a PaO2 of 100, and an SaO2 of 100%. So we plug their hemoglobin in, multiply by 1.34. So 15 times 1.34 is 20.1. And if it's 100%, that's just 1, right? So we've got 20.1. And then 100, that's our PaO2, multiplied by 0 0.031 gives us 0 0.31. So 20.1 20 plus, 20 plus 0 0.31 gives us 20.41. Does that kind of make sense how I got that? And that's what we call, and we measure that in vol percent. Okay, so that's 20.41 milliliters out of 100 milliliters of blood. 20.41 milliliters contains oxygen. The normal CO2 is 16 to 20%. You guys okay with that? Does that make sense? And so here I'm going to rise with a final question. Who is more hypoxemic? You have a 79-year-old female with COPD who has a, an SAO2 of 86% and a hemoglobin of 20. Or a 21-year-old male who is involved in a motor vehicle collision who has an SAO2 of 100% and a hemoglobin of 8. Who is more hypoxemic? Kid. But the kid's saturating at 100%. How can that be? Ah, there you go. So even though this COPD or here has a low SAT, her hemoglobin, that's, remember, that's common in people with chronic hypoxia, hypoxemia, right? That polycythemia, where they, they make more red blood cells, compensates for this, this low SAT. So in fact, this guy here is going to be much more hypoxemic because the hemoglobin is so much lower. You guys good with that? Didn't that make sense? Cool. All right, now I'm done.